Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexandra Papaikonamu. On behalf of Partners in Project Green, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly series of green technology webinars. Today, we are featuring Regen Energy and Virograde Controller. I would like to introduce you to Mike Rose from Regen Energy calling in from Toronto this afternoon. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Alex. Uh, just thought I'd go over um, a little bit on our presentation. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about Regen Energy, the company, and then we'll uh, show you what the EnviroGrid controller system is all about, uh, do a couple of quick uh, case studies, and then uh, take questions. Okay, about Regen Energy, it was founded in Toronto in 2005. We're uh, just near the airport on Belfield Road. We have a very lead experienced leadership team. Uh, our co-founders are Mark Kerbel and Roman Kerlick, you see in the, uh, the picture there. Mark is now uh, heading up our San Diego office. Roman continues in Toronto as our uh, chief technology officer and is leading uh, further development of the project. Our CEO is Tim Angus, who, Tim Angus, sorry, who has been involved in many different uh, green energy companies, and we're very fortunate to have him. Uh, one of our investors is the province of Ontario, and we've just recently closed a $5.5 million uh, round of venture financing. Uh, one of the par uh, by two partners, one is NGen Partners out of California. Uh, green, uh, they're very active in the green energy space, and the other partner was the uh, BDC here in Canada. Uh, in 2007, uh, the company started its initial field trials with a, an earlier version of the controller, uh, and it was funded through OPA research funding. We're continu we continue to be involved with the OPA doing research on uh, demand response uh, for smaller uh, commercial installations. In 2009, we had our initial commercial deployments, and uh, to date, uh, in 2011, there are 57 installations across Canada and the U.S. In Ontario, uh, our technology qualifies for the OPA retrofit incentives and also qualifies for uh, incentives in uh, many U.S. jurisdictions. In fact, we work with some of the utilities uh, on pilot projects and so on. Uh, about the EnviroGrid controllers, uh, it's uh, you can see a picture of one there in the top uh, right corner. Um, it's about the size of your hand. It's uh, quite small. It fits inside. Uh, we put them mostly on uh, rooftop uh, HVAC units. It's a wireless technology for dem electric demand control and load scheduling, and we'll get to that, uh, that uh, in a bit. It's a very cost-effective solution for rooftop air conditioning, and that's where most of our applications are, although we are now looking at uh, chillers as well. Uh, we've also got some installed on resistive heating in a couple of locations, uh, one of which is uh, uh, school portables uh, baseboard heating. Typically we can demand savings are around 20 percent, 30 percent would be a little high, it can be done, uh, in terms of uh, saving of peak. When we model the stuff we put in, in our economic models, we put in a 15 percent reduction in peak, but we typically achieve closer to 20 percent sometimes over. We are actively managing uh, loads with uh, many different customers, uh, for example, Target in the U.S., HPC here in Canada, and recently with the Canadian Standards Association, uh, which is just up on Rexdale, not too far from our office. The EnviroGrid uh, controller reduces energy usage and costs in four ways. The first thing is demand management. This is load balancing. Basically what we're doing is making sure that not all of your loads come on simultaneously as can happen on a hot summer day and so by re by balancing that load we reduce the uh, peak uh, for the month and thereby the uh, charges for that month. Now in Ontario, uh, Toronto's charge is around nine dollars uh, and thirty cents per kW. In New York uh, it's much higher. I was talking to someone today it was around I think they said 30 odd dollars. California is around the same, 32 dollars per kW, and so it's much more important in those markets. But it's still uh, significant in Ontario. The second method uh, that it saves, uh, second way it saves you money, is through scheduling, because uh, as you will see, we are connected to uh, the controllers are connected to our server. We can put schedules out to these controllers so that when units are supposed to be off, we can ensure that they're off. We're the last point of control. Uh, the, the, because the units the controllers sit right on the HVAC units, we can make sure that they're, when they're supposed to be off, they are off. 
The third way is through demand response. If you're participating in demand response programs, it's a much simpler uh, thing to do with our technology than with a building automation system or running around setting back uh, thermostats and so on. You simply dial down the units by one or two notches. They all participate. Uh, occupant comfort uh, it does get a little warmer but it's going to be much more gradual we keep the air moving and all the units continue to run so you don't starve any particular one particular area of cooling at, to, at the expense of, uh, of others. Uh, the fourth way is through continuous commissioning because we measure load we can actually see what's happening real time with the unit so if a unit trips and we've had uh, just in the last week or so a couple of examples where we've discovered units that have tripped put a call out to the customer and to their HVAC service firm somebody goes out and looks at the unit and resets it or, or services it or whatever uh, to get it running again so when they do trip we notice and can send an alert to uh, either through text or email uh, to uh, uh, the customer or their HVAC service firm also because we're measuring actual uh, draw we can see when units are starting to use more electricity than they ought to and that indicates some kind of problem with maybe a dirty filter or something malfunctioning with a compressor something like that and that can be attended to again if they go out of spec an alert would be generated and uh, we can dispatch service also if it's drawing too little electricity now you wouldn't discover this you know through an alert but you might find that looking back over the month uh, something you expected to have kicked, on, uh, kicked in on a hot day to the third or fourth stage it only kicks in the first stage so it tells you there's something wrong and the unit needs to be serviced. The inspiration for our uh, technology is, uh, we call it swarm logic, is a simple honeybee. Honeybee is a very simple insect. It can fly back and forth and not do much else on its own. But when it's in a swarm, it can communicate with it, the other members of the swarm through body language or pheromones, and they're actually able to accomplish much more uh, complex tasks like foraging for food, defending uh, the hive, and, and so on. So uh, a rooftop unit is uh, much like uh, an individual honeybee. It only responds uh, to the thermostat or to a call for cooling from the building automation system but when you arm them with our controllers they suddenly become like a swarm of bees that's because each controller is aware of what's happening on the whole rooftop and it can make an independent decision about what's best for the whole swarm and the what's best in this case is should I let this unit run now or can I delay it slightly in order to reduce uh, peak consumption and that's exactly what we do the important thing to note here, here is that there's no queen bee in either scenario here. Each uh, unit is acting on its own, and that's the same with our units. There's no central processing unit that's making the decisions. All the logic is built into each individual controller, and it makes its decision based on what it sees on going on on the rest of the rooftop. Now, how do we install the system, or how does it work? Well, we put one controller on each HVAC unit. Uh, so they're about the size of your hand. There's a, the, the controller goes inside the HVAC unit. There's a, a, an antenna that's uh, put on top. We drill a hole through and run a wire. So the antenna is sitting on top of the unit and the uh, controller is safely inside. Um, they automatically connect to each other uh, wirelessly. Uh, it's a Zigbee network, which is just an industry standard type network and that's how they talk to each other. So every couple of minutes they broadcast their readings to the entire network. So by readings we actually have part of the controller is a, a two uh, clampable CTs that go around the main so we know how much power the unit uh, is drawing and therefore what it's doing. Um, so they broadcast those readings to each other uh, every two minutes. It's just like the B pheromones. Then each controller makes its own decision about what to do. There's no queen bee, as I said before. Uh, it looks and says, you know, can I, should I run now, let this unit run now if it wants to, or should I delay it for a little while? Another component is the item in the middle there is our cell modem. So the cell modem is used as a gateway to the EnviroGrid servers. Uh, this is a two-way communications, a two-way two communication. Uh, 
the measurement uh, the one direction is the measurements that the uh, units are picking up are passed back to our server and recorded and so we know exactly what's going on and you can see historically what's happening or what's happening you know in real time uh, the other direction we push out schedules to uh, the controllers so that the uh, they respond appropriately for example when it's time to shut the units down for the evening a new schedule is sent out with a zero duty cycle so that all the units shut down in the morning we'll send out the uh, demand management schedule so then all the units will start to uh, cycle up according to their demand management profile now one thing about a profile when we put the units on initially we let them run in what we call baseline so when the unit wants to run it runs and we measure how often it runs in a three hour window so let's say it runs a particular unit runs two and a half hours out of three that means it's running eighty three percent of the time and so that's its natural duty cycle uh, we do this on a really warm day so that we know that on a really warm day this unit needs to run eighty three percent of the time to do its job and once we start the demand management profile that unit will have eighty three percent program programmed in as its duty cycle and then it will run two and a half hours out of three but it will also be responding to whatever else is going on the rooftop so that not all the units overlap. So how does demand management work? If you look at the left hand graph you can see an uncontrolled uh, system. So what's happening there is at one o'clock all the units come on and they, they finish their cycle. At 1.15 they're all off. 1.30 a bunch of them are back on. Then 1.45 they're off and two o'clock they're back on again. And so those five units that come on set the peak for th that day or that month. And it only has to happen in Ontario usually for 15 minutes once a month and that sets your peak. So anything you can do to keep that down is good. Now if you look at the, the second graph, the middle graph, what the uh, EnviroGrid controllers do is introduce short delays so that rather than having all the units come on simultaneously, uh, their, their, the load is balanced and get a reduced peak. Now the blue line that's on both graphs represent the area under that blue line represents the amount of cooling that you get and you'll see that it's exactly the same amount of cooling in both cases. Now that's, we're not going to save you any consumption through this particular part of the program uh, because all we're doing is shifting the load from one place to another so you'll, you'll get a lower peak but the same amount of consumption and that's important you actually want the same amount of consumption because it's the amount of consumption that determines how much cooling you're going to get and that's what you want you want the same amount of cooling just a bit more intelligently uh, delivered now if you participate in demand response uh, what we do there is uh, remember the 83 percent duty cycle let's knock it down by 15 minutes that takes it down to I think 78 percent so uh, two and a quarter hours out of three instead of two and a half hours out of three what we would do is would dial down each unit by one or two notches actually next year this year we're using 15 minute segments next year it'll be 10 minute segments so we dial it down by one or two notches and um, that gets you the demand response uh, reduction that you need without creating a huge wall of uh, heat and humidity that you would get if you simply turned everything off for a little while and it doesn't you don't have to pick which areas are going to be starved because everybody is going to participate in this and so it's a much more intelligent approach to demand response So the next slide here, uh, I want to talk about our EnviroGrid portal, which is the other part of the system. So part of the system is what's on the rooftop. The other part is our, our web-based uh, portal that uh, does a few things. Uh, I'll go down the right-hand side first just so that we cover those features, and then I'll talk a little bit about the graph. So first of all, it's a web-based portal, so there's absolutely no software to install. And the other thing to mention now is that uh, you may have seen before is we use a cell modem to communicate with this so again there's no need to get into your uh, IT systems or your own uh, internet or anything like that it's all outside of those existing systems so you don't have to worry about you know getting your IT people's approval for this because it's all outside of their uh, uh, environment and nothing for them to install the second bullet there is about site level permissions uh, Usually, there, we obviously can make changes to your, your system through, through the portal. 
and so will you be able to, but you're also able to give uh, read-only access to people who might find it useful. For example, your HVAC contractor, if they want to look in to see what's going on on the rooftop, they can go through the web portal and see it, but they wouldn't be able to implement scheduling changes or uh, changing to duty cycles, that kind of thing. Or if you had somebody whose job it was to just look at the site, uh, you know, in the morning and see if anything had happened overnight or the previous day, they could do that without making changes. This, the third point is about scheduling. So uh, we can set up Normally we set up a recurring schedule, so your Monday to, Monday to Friday, evening schedule, daytime and evening schedule, the weekend schedule and so on, that's the recurring part. If you want, supposing you had to come in on the weekend and normally there's a shutdown schedule in place, then you simply tell it to uh, use a, a regular daytime schedule and away you go, the units will all start up. It's all very simple uh, point and click kind of interface and it's very easy to use. The other thing is we can too is we can set up uh, zones. You don't have to have the whole building on one schedule. So if you've got part of it, say part of its offices, part of its warehouse, part of its factory, whatever, we can set up different schedules for different zones. When something goes wrong, as I mentioned earlier, you'll get an alert by email or text message. So if a unit has tripped or it's gone out of spec, uh, then you'll get an email alert. We're currently working on developing an analytics package where you'd get a monthly report showing what was happening with the units. So if something is starting to draw more power than it normally does, that would tip you off to a potential problem. Somebody should go and look at it, that kind of thing. The portal also provides, this is kind of like what's on the, the left-hand side there, uh, real-time or historical load profiles, even across portfolios of sites. So if you've got a bunch of buildings you're managing, you can aggregate them all together and see what's happening. You can look at each individual building, you can look at each individual group, uh, if you've got it set up by zones, right down to the controller level, uh, where you'll get uh, you know, a two-minute interval um, uh, data on what's actually happening with the unit. You can export this data, you can look at it in graphical form, or you can send it out to an Excel spreadsheet. And so if you want to do any kind of analysis, um, you're actually able to do that quite simply. Now the graph on the left is actually one of our customers. It's the uh, Cricket Club here in Toronto. Um, they have two zones set up. Uh, one is uh, for the uh, dining room and kitchen, and the other is for the remaining uh, rooftop units. I believe there are 24 units in total. Uh, at this site. So the uh, the yellow line at the very bottom there is the dining room and kitchen and that's on its own schedule. The blue light blue line above it is the the other rooftop units and the red line above that is the um, the total of the two. So that's the controlled load altogether and you can see what's happening. Now an example of scheduling is you can see that on the overnight the consumption drops to zero. That's because we're scheduling those units to be off and uh, that's actually been uh, a big part of the saving for them is that they make sure that those units are off when they're supposed to be off. Uh, they found when we measured during the commissioning stage that a lot of stuff was running overnight and on the you know when the, the club was not open and uh, they were wasting a lot of money. The third line or the fourth line, the, the, the gray line that goes up and down is uh, something that's new this year that's our building monitor. So we put a controller on the building mains. It doesn't actually control anything, but it, it's able to measure uh, the consumption of the building and report it uh, on the same portal as all the other stuff. So that lets you see what's going on in the entire building, not just the loads that we are controlling. And the lines that are above it, the uh, there's the three dotted lines above it, those are thresholds. So if the building starts to, as it goes through each of those thresholds, email or text alerts can be sent. This is particularly important if you're participating in demand response and that top line represents the, your, your uh, agreed to target. If you go through that agreed to target, uh, usually there are financial penalties. So the uh, targets there are set as you approach them and go through them, you'll be getting uh, email alerts to let you know that there's something going on with the building that's a bit unexpected and gives you time to take action before you face any kind of uh, financial penalties. Okay. Part of the portal is setting, I, I haven't shown it here, is setting up schedules. As I said, they, the, uh, the weekly uh, schedule, uh, we set up a profile. So there's a, like an overnight profile, shut everything off, uh, 
sometimes we have a staggered profile for the morning startup and shutdown so that not everything comes on at its full duty cycle in the morning and you know maybe a couple of hours at a reduced duty cycle and then into its full duty cycle as the day wears on. Now uh, the type of facilities that, that uh, we find very good uh, are st uh, stuff that's got uh, if we look at the bottom left there, the preferred site characteristics, low wide buildings with lots of open spaces. So we like to have, um, you know, places where air can move around because what we're going to be doing is shutting units off or preventing them from running uh, for a short period of time. And so you want something which, where the air is going to kind of move around to mitigate the, uh, the effect of having uh, the unit shut off. If you have a whole pile of closed off offices, each with its own unit, it doesn't work so well. We like buildings that are fairly large. 50,000 square feet would actually be kind of the small end of what we usually manage. It's, you know, closer to 100,000 square feet usually. They can be managed as part of a portfolio of sites if you want to do that. And one of the key things is, uh, particularly in Ontario, in order to realize the economics is we need to have buildings that are unoccupied uh, some of the time so that we can actually shut the units off. This is where a good chunk of the savings come from um, uh, in Ontario in the, the markets in the US where they have very high demand charges uh, a lot of the savings come from the uh, just being able to control the peak. Um, the type of facilities that we would be interested in or where we, we work well is as I said big open areas so big box stores and you know, we've got Target, we uh, HPC is one of our customers we're testing it at, at uh, Sears and so on. Um, Factories, we've got a couple of factories where we're running stuff. Craft uh, is uh, using our stuff. Again, it's got big open s space. Office buildings, depending on the layout. Call centers, we have a call center that we are, we've are uh, we just uh, this year put uh, units onto, and so on. The other one that I'd just like to mention there uh, is uh, schools and portable classrooms. Now there it's not HVAC, although there is some. It's the uh, resistive heating, the baseboard heating, where we're actually able to save quite a bit of money because those things are... Um, both for peak because they peak out quickly, uh, a group of portables will peak out quickly on a cold winter day and we're able to um, by introducing very short delays um, reduce that peak and of course then they're unoccupied a good chunk of the week, uh, you know, evenings and weekends and we can make sure that the, uh, they dial themselves down properly uh, and uh, save money that way. So the kind of things we're looking for for HVAC is the packaged uh, HVAC units, especially you know the rooftop units. We like them to be 10 tons uh, or bigger. Uh, the units we will do five ton units. It does work for that. It's not a problem. We find the economics are better for the, the larger units. And again, we can work with the uh, resistive heating banks. Um, we also uh, important point note is it works with or without a building automation system. So uh, the, the building automation system often will do the scheduling, although we often find that once we start measuring, somebody's fooled around with the building automation system a month or a year ago, never changed it back, and you've still got stuff running when it's not supposed to, uh, and nobody's aware of it until we actually go in and monitor. So we do actually, uh, we are actually able to develop, deliver scheduling benefits even with the building automation system, usually. But the thing that we do that the building automation systems won't do is the peak reduction. And we work just fine with the building automation systems. We worked with uh, quite a few different ones. Probably, oh, I think over half the sites that we've implemented do have a building automation system. Let's just talk a bit about pricing and the return on investment. So our initial cost, we charge $1,200 for each controller and $1,200 for that uh, uh, gateway cell modem. Um, that's the basic price. Um, it takes about an hour per controller to install. So if you've got 10 controllers, it's going to be uh, 10 hours. Or 12 controllers would be 12 hours to install. So it doesn't take a long time. It's not weeks and weeks and weeks. It's, uh, it's fairly quick to do. The customer pays the installation costs and we just uh, get them to budget about an hour per controller. If it's a smaller site, less than 10, we ask them to add an extra couple of hours just for the setup. For annual fees, we charge two years up front, uh, $150 per controller per year, and $600 uh, in telecom fees. That's for the cell modem per year. The, the telecom fee is just basically straight pass-through. That's what it costs us. 
Return on investment or payback period, it's typically around two years. Um, sometimes it's less, uh, sometimes it's a bit more, but it, around two years is a good mark. In Ontario, we find that this 20 percent of the savings come from reducing uh, peak demand. 80 percent come from scheduling. That's because we can, even if the, there's a small amount of stuff going on over nights and weekends, by shutting that off, we can save a significant amount of money. As I said earlier, uh, or at the beginning of the presentation, uh, the technology is eligible for OPA incentives. Uh, in our case, it's $800 per kilowatt uh, uh, in peak reduction. Uh, typically, we use less than half of what's available because there's a 50% cap on uh, the 50% uh, of the cost cap on what you can get for incentives. So, if the if the system costs uh, twenty thousand dollars. Uh, you can get at most ten thousand dollars back from the OPA incentives, even if it's saving you, uh, you know, uh, twenty-five thousand dollars worth of, of. If you were eligible for twenty-five thousand dollars at uh, eight hundred dollars per kW, so we typically use uh, less than half of what's available, which means that we can bundle in additional projects. So if you've got something else that you want to put in that doesn't save as much electricity, it's it's related to energy efficiency but won't give you uh, the eight hundred dollars per kilowatt. If we bundle the project we can claim more of that incentive. Okay, a couple of case studies. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Toronto Cricket Club. Oh, it's 23 controllers, sorry, not 24. Um, uh, in two zones, uh, so as we mentioned before, the uh, kitchen and dining room and the, the, the rest. Um, the combined, uh, the, the, the old uh, program under which this was uh, done was uh, BOMA. Uh, they were doing the, the management of it and the incentive we expect to get back there is somewhere between seventeen and twenty three thousand um, dollars. The combined savings, uh, with combined, combined with the savings including the, the, uh, the incentive, the payback was just over one year. And you can see the results there uh, for peak demand. The baseline they were uh, you know, uncontrolled, that means they were using 138 kilowatts, uh, that was their peak in a month. With the controllers on, it was 114 for a saving of 24 kilowatts. Uh, that's a 17 percent reduction. Their annual savings there were um, just over $1,000. On the consumption side, um, they actually got quite aggressive in our initial um, uh, cut at this. It was about half that and once they sort of saw what was happening, they actually uh, got quite a bit more aggressive on the scheduling and this is what we ended up with. So on their their daily consumption on KWH was uh, just over 2,000 and with the controls on we were able to knock that down to around 900 for, for reduction of uh, 1,100 or nearly 1,200 KWH and that's quite a big saving, 57 percent. And you can see that's where their savings really piled up, uh, their annual savings. So the uh, the cost of the system there was 26,000, the BOMA incentive was 17, and uh, the annualized savings was six. So what's that come up to? Twenty-three, twenty-four thousand. So it's just over a year in terms of payback. Um, the other thing to note was other work was combined with the Envirogrid installation. So the Cricket Club was able to max out the available incentive. That is, they weren't limited by the fifty percent cap on uh, fifty percent, the cap of fifty percent of our costs because they were adding in other equipment. Uh, in 2011, we added that building monitor because they were uh, interested in doing that as well. The second case study is a Target store in California. Um, Target was very concerned uh, that our system would deliver, well, they were concerned to make sure that our system would deliver the same uh, comfort level to their customers because the last thing they want to have is, you know, a hot a store, people just exit the store. So it was very important to them to make sure that this was the case. So on the graph here, the top green line uh, represents the maximum interior temperature. This was done over two weekends. On the left, the units were just left to run uh, uncontrolled whenever they wanted to. That's our baseline run. On the right, it was uh, controlled. All right, so the uh, green line is the maximum temp exterior temperature. The red line at the bottom is the average exterior temperature. So you can actually see on the controlled weekend, it was uh, slightly higher than it was uh, for the uncontrolled weekend. Now the two lines I'd like you to, to draw your attention to are the interior temperature sensors. So on the uncontrolled weekend, the blue one was 
they had two different zones for two different temperatures. You can see that the zone uh, with the dotted blue line on both uh, the uncontrolled and controlled are exactly the same. So we were able to maintain the same temperature for that one and also the red one which was a slightly lower temperature. Uh, on the controlled weekend it gave you the same result as it did on the uncontrolled weekend uh, and so the target was convinced that they were a, we were able to deliver the same interior comfort uh, running our system as without. The other thing to notice too is that we're able to significantly reduce the peak. So you can see on the uncontrolled weekend there's a much higher peak. It's just over 80 kilowatt. Or sorry, uh, no, reading the wrong scale, right hand scale. It's around 130 kilowatts, um, or closer to 140 kilowatts on the uncontrolled weekend. On the control weekend, you can see it's around 100 kilowatts, and so there's quite a significant reduction in peak. Now they weren't doing overnight scheduling, so you don't see the shutdown, but uh, you can see we got a significant reduction in peak. One of the things that um, Target was very concerned about was participating in demand response and being able to do that. They had previously experienced uh, significant financial penalties because their earlier systems weren't able to deliver and they were very keen on having uh, our system in because we can participate in demand response and know what's happening to their units. So that was a, a very important feature for them. And by the way, uh, they run uh, building automation systems on all of their buildings. So that's it. Uh, so I'd like to uh, open it up for questions. Questions here. The first one being, does the system only work on chillers? Uh, well, uh, we actually haven't done any chillers to date. It's been the rooftop uh, HVAC units. But uh, we have been talking to a couple of customers about uh, uh, chillers, uh, and we'll see if we can do that. Our chief technology officer, Roman Kurlik, uh, believes that we can, and so we will be doing some experimenting with that. Okay, then um, also, what type of system support will be available to customers? Well, uh, we don't have somebody manning the phone 724, but they are available through uh, cell phones. Uh, if you have an emergency or something like that in the middle of the night, you can always reach us. Um, we, When we install the system, uh, the kind of support you can expect is that we will stay with you until you're happy with what, it, until, until you're happy with what it's doing. So as I said, when we install the system initially, we're going to run it in baseline, we're going to set up the duty cycles, we'll let it run for a bit, we're going to do measurement verification which is very important for getting your incentive money back, we run alternating days, you know, controlled, uncontrolled, we get a nice set of data, we apply for your incentive, but throughout that whole period as you're commissioning, you know, we're making sure that you're comfortable with where the building is set and we won't leave you until you're happy with it. And again, we maintain uh, the, the, uh, the alerts and so if something going wrong with your building, be getting those uh, alerts, you'll be, be getting those things on an ongoing basis. Okay, great. And then also, have you been required to baseline buildings prior to installation, for example, grants? Uh, no, we don't baseline them prior because we're baselining once the system is on. So we're actually measuring the consumption of the units when they're uncontrolled and then we measure them again when they are being controlled. And so that's how we establish uh, the reduction in peak uh, for uh, the grants. Okay. Oh, by and the way, just one other thing I'd like to sorry one other thing I'd like mm -hmm. to mention on support. So the the annual fees includes a uh, warranty. So if the unit breaks, we will replace it, and it includes the the monitoring fees and sending out the alerts and uh, upgrades. So as things come along, for example, we're we're going to adaptive duty cycling uh, next year. We're going to the shorter uh, ten minute cycle uh, for our next round, and so that will all be provided as as we upgrade the system and make it even you know try and squeeze more uh, energy savings out of it. That's all mm -hmm. included in those annual fees. And so it's the warranty for the uh, controller and modem themselves? Uh, yep. Each? Yep. 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 And how long is that warranty? Oh, as long as you own the system, as long as you're paying the fees. Okay. If the thing breaks, we'll replace it. Okay. Okay, so then also the next question How does the system work conflict with BATH? Well, the building automation systems, it doesn't really. The The only thing you worry about is uh, if we introduce a delay, the building automation system may go, hey, may go, hey this thing didn't start when I asked it to and mm -hmm. set, a, uh, set an alarm. We usually just ask the, uh, we get the building automation system to program the alarm uh, window to be a bit longer so that it doesn't alarm because, it, you know, within, you know, a few minutes it's going to start up. We just don't want it to, to alarm too quickly. But otherwise it works fine. Okay, great. Will the system ever be available for smaller units? 
Yeah, we can work with just about anything. Uh, as I say, five tons is probably the smallest that makes economic sense to do. Uh, we've done one or two four-ton units just because somebody asked us to, but you know the economics aren't aren't really there. Um, so mm -hmm. that's why we set the, the the lower limit. It's just it doesn't make economic sense. And then in the case uh, that you provided for portables at schools, are aren't those small units? And then how many tons are the units in that in in this instance? Well, the portables, they're around uh, four or five kW per portable, uh, okay. which is kind of small, but I mean, you know, it's it's the aggregate that matters here. Okay. Okay, so in uh, California, how many of the 57 installations were not incentivized? Um, there were a few. Some of them, uh, I think uh, Mark Kerbel was telling us that uh, uh, some of the things were pilots, um, people didn't want to apply to utilities yet when we started the longer rollouts um, you know they would get the, they would apply for and then get the incentives it's a bit different than in the US in Canada all of our uh, our our, uh, our installations uh, applied for or in Ontario anyway all applied for uh, the uh, OPA incentives okay great and then does the system only improve on the air conditioning side or does it help with heating as well well uh, up to date, we've mostly focused on the air conditioning side. So now you can, you could do the same sort of thing in, in the winter with you know reduce the cycling and so on and, and you know overnight you wouldn't shut it down. Obviously, you don't want stuff to freeze, but uh, you know you could reduce it. The the thing is, there's no incentive for that in the winter time in terms of electricity, and I don't believe there's any gas incentive either. But if you just wanted to save money, we'd certainly work with you to uh, reduce your duty cycles on the overnight. Uh, to see if we could save gas and electricity, obviously, with the fans. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you machine on motors? Um, you could if it's a cycling kind of thing. We haven't really. Um, typically, motors are on for a reason, for some kind of production uh, uh, thing, and we, we really haven't done it for that kind of thing. I guess if somebody could you know show us an application where you could introduce a delay without impacting a process, we'd be happy to do it, but up to date, no. Okay, and then has access for mobile devices for smartphones? Um, no, we haven't. We don't have an app for a mobile phone app. If you can get a web browser up on your uh, your mobile phone, then you can do it that way. I've tried it a couple of times. It works. It isn't pretty, but uh, we haven't developed a mobile app yet. As you said, you do receive emails and texts. Yeah, no, but if you wanted to use know. the web portal for, for mm -hmm. if you wanted to use the web portal, you could. I mean, it's possible. Uh, okay. It's just, it's a little hard. We haven't developed a mobile app yet. Okay. And if so, were they demand response or energy efficiency incentives? In California, there have been installations done without applying for incentives due to being part of a utility funded pilot project or others uh, of large customers that wish to fly under the wire initially before considering larger visible, visible projects where in full incentives will be applied for. Those initial product projects are about to come to fruition in California with very large deployments. Okay, and then how does the controller actually control the loads, for example, in regards to motors? Okay, well, on the on the HVAC units, there's uh, there's two relays, and so what happens is the control signal comes into the controller. Controller either decides to allow the unit to run or not, and that will use its relays. To, uh, we can control either fans and a compressor or a couple of stages of compressor. We have uh, two, rel two relays that are available. So that's basically how it's done. It's done with you know, relays. We have a, the, the, uh, the, the controller takes its power from the HVAC unit, so we have a step-down transformer from either uh, 575 or 208 volts down to 24 volts, which runs our controller, and then it uses that power to uh, you know, power the relays and then let the, uh, turn the contactors on or off. Okay, great. And then are there any installations done in Toronto that can be toured? Um, well, yes, it depends how uh, far along you are in terms of interest. Uh, we can certainly arrange for that. Uh, the Cricket Club has uh, indicated a willingness to, uh, to, to do that for us, and so we, I'm sure we could find some other sites as well that might be more suitable to each application. Okay, great. Well, that's it for this afternoon. Thank you again, Mike Rose, for joining us. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.